Hello, SciShow viewers. This, you may have noticed, does not look like your everyday episode of SciShow because it's uh, my office where I do my work. Today, we're giving you something a little bit different, and I will explain that to you. Now, as you may know, SciShow has a spinoff podcast. It's called SciShow Tangents. If you have not listened to it before or you just need a refresher, Tangents is part game show, part comedy podcast with the same healthy dose of amazing science content that you expect from SciShow. Each week, I get together with my friends, science expert Sari Riley and resident everyman Sam Schultz to play quiz games, trade mind-blowing science facts, and answer questions from our listeners. And, as the name Tangents might suggest, we very frequently veer wildly off topic. We've been doing the show for a few years now, and it's a ton of fun, but we thought, how can we make it even more fun? And the answer is, we should have a video version of the podcast, and that's what we're doing. Every Tuesday, we will still be releasing the podcast, which you can listen to wherever you listen to podcasts, but we will also be releasing a video video version of the show at youtube.com slash scishow tangents. But what you're watching right now is an exclusive episode of the scishow tangents video podcast. You will not find this one over on the tangents page. It's just for y'all. And if you enjoy, you can go on over to youtube.com slash scishow tangents to watch another brand new episode about worms. And you can subscribe to that channel if you want to. But for now, please enjoy this special presentation of the scishow tangents video podcast, the only time it will ever be on this channel. <laughs> Welcome to SciShow Tangents, the lightly competitive knowledge showcase. I'm your host, Hank Green, and joining me this week, as always, is science expert, Sari Riley. Hello. And our resident everyman, Sam Schultz. Hello. You guys, I was just at the grocery store, and by complete chance, I noticed when I went to go get a Coke, there was a Coke that said on it, Coke Starlight. Oh. Coca-Cola Starlight. And then on, on the bottom it said space flavored. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm about to go, I'm about to go record a science podcast. I haven't heard about this. It's space, science, this it's gonna be a, a spacey episode in general. I have to get this space flavored Coca-Cola. I tried to read the press release that Coca-Cola, of course, put out about this. Um and they said nothing about why it was space flavored. They were like, we worked very hard on this. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> we, we gave so much freedom to our creative flavor teams. They were able to work without constraints in a yeah. nonlinear fashion to make whatever it was that this is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, but at no, at no point was it like, here's why it's space flavored. Like space has these compounds that are aromatic and they yeah. smell like this and so maybe if you concentrated space it would taste like this coke but i would like to know what you think this space coke is going to taste like and then i'm going to taste it oh and you will notice you'll notice that it's like half drank already oh, you know but i wasn't paying it i wasn't paying attention for the first <laughs> three or four sips i was just very thirsty i, I was having a spicy chicken stick and i saw oh. there's no no tasting happened i okay. drank it but i didn't taste it yet the problem is, is any flavor I can think of for space is gross. It's like dust, or is it? It's metallic. Dusty. I don't think either of those things are marketable enough that Coke would do that. Do this much of a no? Push. They want it to taste good for sure. Yeah. They really. It's, you'll notice it's also like red. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. It's like a dark red instead of brown. I feel like so. There is also at the grocery store, but a while ago. Mm. At the, at the grocery store in Missoula, where there's the shelf of discarded, the, yeah. the lost toys shelf. I, man, there's nothing I love more than that shelf at the food farm with a bunch of things that <laughs> nobody else wanted. <laughs> I miss it so much. Just one end cap of complete, just uh, unhinged food ideas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Correct. So on that shelf... <laughs> At one point, there were polar seltzer for kids, unicorn oh, okay. kisses flavor. Oh. <laughs> and ah. unicorn kisses, polar seltzer, if I remember correctly, tasted kind of like cotton candy. Like mm -hmm. they just dumped sugar, sure. okay. sugar fruit into it. Yeah. And so I imagine mm -hmm. I could see that all those images of space looking like cotton candy. So my guess is that this right. space Coke tastes like unicorn kisses, like which tastes like cotton yeah. candy. Samuel Schultz. Hank, I got some sore news for you, brother. Ooh. I've had like five bottles of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> You're addicted to the flavor of space. <laughs> I, hadn't bought a, I hadn't bought a bottle of Coke for years. Yeah, like, we talked stuff, about this. This stuff's my 
perfect. Oh. I love it. Wow. Yeah. What full- so I can't wait okay. in because I know exactly <laughs> I'm all too familiar with how it tastes. Wow. I you just you just keep going back for more? Yeah. You're gonna say you're gonna well, drink it and go, Oh, I don't like it. But <laughs> that's not gonna stop me. I love I really it. I deeply doubt it. Like is it, I I've looked at the ingredients and it's got all the stuff I like the most. High fructose corn um, syrup. <laughs> yep. Uh-huh. That's, uh, that's ma- about basically it. it. Artificial <laughs> flavors, maybe maybe a natural flavor is thrown in there. Who knows? Yeah, they got natural flavors. They got fruit and vegetable juice for color. They got that's it. It's not a very long list. No. Uh, I will say. It's All good right, for everybody. you. All right, everybody. Let's, let's, it's good for you. Oh, I, the cap wasn't on, so I didn't get the noise. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Tuna mix all three of those together. It'll sound just like a cup. <laughs> um, it smells like cherry Coke is what it smells huh. like to me, but not quite. You know, a little less. Cherry Coke, but a little less. Oh, yeah, that's delicious. It's certainly got a sweetness that is reminiscent of cotton candy. It's yeah. got a little bit of that caramelized flavor that is kind of cotton candy You know, yeah, I don't know I what they do to say. cotton candy to make it cotton candy, but it's got like a caramel feel. Sari wasn't too far off. There's a little bit of a, maybe a raspberry uh, to it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, and it has kind of like a, almost like a minty, menthol finish, I, said, I would say. <laughs> it does. Yeah, <laughs> I hadn't noticed that until you said it. It's yeah. got a little bit of a cool. When you it's got a little in, bit of like, a physically yeah. cool. Like you have ice yeah. cube in your mouth or something. Oh, yeah, it's great. you're right. Mm. And you can That's just imagine space yourself is like. floating in space in a nebula, but you're alive. You're not dead. You're just floating yeah. in stardust. And you're just breathing in and it tastes like that. Yeah. Coca-Cola, congratulations. I looked and I saw that you did <laughs> a, 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 a brand deal with some, some pop star. And I got to say, I... I am available. I'm a space a, guy. You have a channel called you Sideshow you, Space. Mm-hmm. Yeah. God you could have worked with an astronaut. You could have worked with me. You could have worked with probably CGP Grey. I don't know. Kurtzkazat. All those people. Late. But congratulations to the people at Coca-Cola for making new and interesting things happen to people's <laughs> mouths. Yeah. Thank you, Coke. <laughs> it's the longest we've ever talked about anything on this show ever. <laughs> that was a really cheap brand deal. Holy crap. All right. Every week here on Tangents, we get together to try to one-up, amaze, and delight each other with science facts while also trying to stay on topic. Our panelists are playing for Glory and for Hank Bucks, which I will be awarding as we play. And at the end of the episode, one of them will be the winner. Now, as always, we introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem. This week, it's from Sam. It was a pleasant day in primordial spring, though to the asteroid, that didn't mean a thing. The mass Hmm. extinction that ended dinosaurs' reign, from a cosmic perspective, was somewhat mundane. See, physics had forecast this fateful meeting in the earliest days of the millennia preceding. A star system formed just like many before, with the usual planets and a sun at the core. One planet exploded, an asteroid belt forms. This is all very common, well within the norm. A rock's jostled loose, breaks gravity's hold, and its date with the planet Earth was foretold. And through trajectory, inertia, and a little bad luck, Earth had no choice except to be struck. To have its crust scarred, to lose most its inhabitants, that's just how it happens, not on purpose or accident. It was a pleasant day in primordial spring, though to the asteroid, that didn't mean a thing. Sam, that was beautiful. (laughs) I went into a few states. I feel like you worked really hard on that one. Yeah, that felt like librarian Sam or like (laughs) Professor Sam came out and was like, hello, let me teach you about asteroids. You're so red right now. Like you're embarrassed that your poem was good. I am embarrassed because you're both looking at me, as you always are. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I had this big eating grin because it was just good you used so many big words i was like wow poetry <laughs> yeah mm. there was a lot i didn't of uh, things i didn't expect but then they this is like, wh- one of my favorite things is when you don't you're like where's this gonna go and then it's like ah there mm-hmm. that was probably well worked well it's not like uh it's not like sam when he sometimes is like i'm gonna make this rhyme now wait a it minute doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> you could just say nice things to me for once in your life <laughs> i love all your poems sam the topic of today's episode is asteroids which are sari <laughs> <laughs> you know, the the more I read about them, the more I realized. The fuzzier the line got. The yeah, that was my the line got. Too. Yep. Oh, no. It it seems like we started out knowing what they were. 
as with many things in science, we were like, ah, a new thing, a rock in space that's not Uh so small and it's not so big. I'm going to name that after hemorrhoids. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to name it after stars plus. uh, Yeah, star hemorrhoids. Is that real? No, it's not for hemorrhoids. Oid. Oid, but it's to to know or to see. That is oid. So a hemorrhoid is just like a blood thing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's oh. not great. <laughs> <Like> that. <laughs> but yes, it's from like a star thing, like stir, like asterisk or asteroid or astronaut or any of the astros gotcha. is, is in there. The general discovery of asteroids uh, the first one was Ceres, which is Humongo, one of the big the big boys in the mm-hmm. asteroid belt. And the second one to be discovered was Pallas. They were discovered in 1801 and 1802. And as astronomers and science rich white dudes in Europe were debating what to call them, mm-hmm. a lot of words got thrown out, including Planaret, Planetel. Love it. Planetool. Good. Planet Kid, nice. which is a little oh, weird. That's cute. Uh, Planetling. <laughs> okay, I like. Oh these. wow! <laughs> but then William Herschel, I don't. Some astronomer, one of the astronomers, was like, "I do not want to confuse asteroids with planets." Great yeah. debate of the not sky. Even close. Do, not even close. They're so small. They're yeah. so rocky. They haven't earned it. They haven't. Yeah, they haven't earned yeah. the planet title. And so he was like, "Uh." Well, if you look at them through a telescope, they're kind of like bright points of light, kind of like a star. So I'm going to call them asteroids because they're star-like. Yeah, so you found the one thing that they're less like yep. than planets. <laughs> <laughs> and I think according to this article that I was reading, I didn't have time or the desire to read two books about the nomenclature of asteroid. But there was a nice article that summarized the the back and forth argument. But apparently... He felt like, we'll just come up with something better in the future. Little did he know how lazy we are. (laughs) I think Planet Ling would have been dope, and we maybe should have done that. But but it's done, and we can't can't win that fight now. You have to reprint so many books. Is is there a thing that is an asteroid and a thing that is a comet and like a sharp line between them? Is it like where they are in the solar system, or is it what they're made out of, or et cetera? Both. It's not a sharp line, though. It's it's more like we started naming some things asteroids and comets and thought there was a hard line, and then that line has become mm. blurrier and blurrier as we found more things. Of course. So This is what happened with the butt yeah, and the legs. Yeah. It's what happened with literally anything we in kept... science. Words are just <laughs> yeah. approximate descriptors. So if you have rocky stuff in space, on the on the tiny end is your meteoroid, which is just like Mm -hmm. a relatively small object. You can hold it in your hand somewhere between the size of a grain of dust and like a a small asteroid. Like a small asteroid, like a a watermelon? Yeah, I think like a watermelon. My house. Like a watermelon or a couple meters, somewhere between a a watermelon and a yardstick. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'll tell you, I don't think I could pick up an asteroid that that was a meter long. Yeah. But that's where it starts becoming an asteroid. But then asteroid, the other end of asteroid is around the size of Ceres or Vesta, which are 530 kilometers in diameter, which is like... That's big. Big. Like starting to get nowhere near the size of our moon, but still like a a big rock. You could walk on it and and have a good time. You could jump and you might come back down. Yeah. And then you get to... (laughs) nebulous rocks that are dwarf planets and planets that are just bigger than that. But what distinguishes a dwarf planet versus a planet is how it's cleared the area around it. But you become a dwarf planet when you're like big enough to make yourself into a sphere. Yes. Yeah. Mm. And so there are so so Ceres, for example, the asteroid I keep bringing up because it was the first one discovered is also a dwarf planet. It is in the asteroid belt. But it's also an asteroid. But it's also an asteroid. And then just... To flesh out the definition, so a comet as opposed to an asteroid. An asteroid is mostly made of like rock or metal, um, whereas a comet is mostly made of ice and like very tiny dust particles. Uh, and that's what gives it its tail effect is the water vaporizing or the dust trailing out behind it. I guess I'm surprised in some ways, but not super surprised in other ways that it took so long to find one of these. But did we know that there were like rocks zipping around up there 
before we actually laid eyes on one? Or were we like, what the, what the heck? Because they were landing on us, right? We just hadn't thought about where they were before they were here or something. Yes and no. I think when people discovered, or, or from my research, when people found meteoric iron on the earth, so like before we smelted iron, Mm-hmm. The, the main metal tools used by human civilizations were meteoric iron that they mm-hmm. found nice. and then honed or crafted in some way, uh, which is very That's cool. just so epic. Yeah. yeah it's so epic. Cool. It's like, are you like, ev- like what's, what is that? Oh, you know, just a thing that like doesn't exist on the planet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Landed here, just came down from the sky. We're like, I can't believe people thought of these, all the things they thought. Are, what, are, do, can you not believe it? What a strange universe. <laughs> the, the only way to make a, to make a metal knife was to find one from stuff space. falling out of the sky. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I think there was some acknowledgement that those things fell from the sky and were like weird. But I don't know where the mythology crossed over into the scientific of there are other rocks up there and that these mm-hmm. small chunks of metal came off of bigger rocks called asteroids. The observations of the first asteroids in, in European cultures were when we had already started tracking the movement, the movements of planets and stars in the sky or like the relatively static positions of stars in, in the sky compared to planets. Then they would image the sky over and over again and find things that were moving in patterns unlike planets and unlike stars and they were like oh this is a third thing this is a rock in the sky so i imagine anyone who was doing that kind of astronomical measurement also realized that there were more things in the sky i just don't know Mm -hmm. in what ways it was recorded in history and in what ways that has been passed down knowledge wise in a way that we can capture on this podcast like i don't know who, who would have found yeah. asteroids beforehand? And, like, there's pros- probably a lot of, like, oral histories that include rock rocks mm. from space, but uh, I don't know them. Yeah, and also what is space? Yeah. Like, it took us a long time to figure out what that, that space was. Yeah. That it was. Well, I think that makes me feel like I have a general idea of what an asteroid is is and is not and also that all of course we're just making up words for stuff and now we also have the etymology of hemorrhoids which turns out is not grand (laughs) and that means that it's time to move on to the quiz portion of our show this week we're gonna be playing an asteroids truth or fail people have been looking to the skies for ages discovering stars and discovering planets and in the process asteroids surely they have been driven by noble pursuits like understanding the fundamental truths of the universe But at the end of the day, even scientists are human and are complicated, nuanced creatures, which means their motivations can be tinged by pettier needs like vanity and competition. The following are three stories of the very human pursuit of asteroids. Only one of them is true. Which one? Sounds like someone's going to have sex with an asteroid in this. Is that what's happening? (laughs) No. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) No, there's, you know, you'll get, you'll understand. Fact number one, in the 19th century, a team of astronomers banded together into a group that they called the Celestial Police because they were on the hunt for what they believed was a missing planet between Mars and Jupiter. But they did not find that planet, but they did discover Vesta, the brightest asteroid in the asteroid belt. I love that. The Celestial Police. Or it could be fact number two. In the 1970s, an astronomer had been following the trajectory of an asteroid for months when one night they realized that they could no longer see the asteroid because a competing astronomer had sabotaged their telescope. But in the process (laughs) of repairing the telescope and retracing their measurements, the astronomer discovered a set of asteroids whose orbits would cross with the Earth. Hmm. Or... It could be fact number three. Asteroids sometimes take on strange shapes, like the dog-bone-shaped Cleopatra. In 2013, a group of astronomers at JPL decided to create an office pool to see who could find a stranger asteroid than that. And the winner was 2014 RC, which won not because it looked strange, but because it is one of the fastest rotating asteroids ever discovered. So, is it? The Celestial Police, the Starry Scientific Sabotage, or the Office Pool Discovery. What year was the police one? It was the 19th century. Were they using the word police back then? Where did that word come from? (laughs) I'm pretty sure that the word was around. Hmm. 
I mean, that makes sense because a lot of people throughout history and even nowadays are like, isn't the asteroid belt another planet that just broke apart, like a secret planet? Mm -hmm. And so that's like been a long standing guess or wonderment about the universe. And so I can totally imagine scientists going for that too and being like, I'm going to find the planet first and then finding mm -hmm. something else instead. Sounds like Hank thought of a fun, a fun word and wrote a factor in it to me. <laughs> Is sabotage actually pretty common or was pretty common? And there's definitely stories of scientific sabotage. It happened. There was a long period of uh, constant sabotage in paleontology right. where it was really a sort of ego game for a long time. That's sort of like where it's most famous. Hmm. Rock people are a little rough and tumble. I feel like that's that's how they're <laughs> portrayed in the they scientific community. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I I feel like people try and sabotage each other all the time. And especially with asteroids, when we were first discovering them, people were like, ah, got to name them. I want to name them cool things. And I know there's a period of time where people named asteroids just for fun. Like one's named Mr. Spock after not Star Trek, but like indirectly because it's someone's cat was named Mr. Spock. And so they named the asteroid after their cat, which is named uh -huh. after Star Trek. <laughs> and so I can totally see someone being like, okay, I'm on the track. I'm going to name this after my wife or something like that. I'm going to name this cool <laughs> rock. And then someone else sabotages their telescope. I really like the office pool one. And here's why. Because it feels like they thought of this idea and they were like, well, it's fine. Weird meteors. And then after a few weeks, they were like, Mm, this is kind of boring, but I guess somebody has to win. <laughs> so we'll just make up some other reason that this person won. Because I'm tired of I'm tired of this. I don't want to be doing this anymore. <laughs> yeah, we've looked at so many. So, yeah, they're mostly just shaped yeah. like. Yeah. Uh, but you know, this one's fast, so I guess you win. So I'm going with that one. So we're gonna go with Sari. I'm gonna go with the first one. I'm gonna start with the Starry Scientific Sabotage because Sari, that one it was fake, but you got rem like remarkably close to the reality oh. by accident. So the sabotage completely made up. Wouldn't be surprised if it happened, but as far as I can tell, the, the thing like that didn't happen. But uh, this was inspired by the Aten asteroids, which are a group of asteroids whose orbits intersect with Earth's orbit. And the first one was discovered in the 70s by Eleanor Henlin, an astronomer at JPL, who discovered lots of asteroids and minor planets. And in 1991, Star Trek debuted a ship named the USS Henlin on Star Trek VI, oh. the undiscovered country. So you were right. There was a Star Trek connection. I don't know how you knew that, but you did. As for the office pool discovery, 2014 RC is a small asteroid that flew close to the Earth in 2014, and astronomers measured that the asteroid rotated every 15.8 seconds, making it one of the fastest rotating asteroids uh, ever measured, but there was not, as far as I could tell, any bet involved. And so the answer is indeed the yes. celestial police. So at the end of the 18th and 19th centuries, astronomers were super fascinated by this mathematical law. I don't know how it's pronounced. Titius Bode's law, which is a theory that predicted the spacing between the planets and that William Herschel used to discover the planet Uranus. And it also, this law, predicted that there was a missing planet somewhere between Mars and Jupiter, so astronomers were very excited to find it and be the first ones to find it, and that included the Celestial Police, a group of astronomers from across Europe who gathered at an observatory in Germany in pursuit of this planet that turned out to not exist. In 1801, <laughs> uh, Italian astronomer uh, Giuseppe Piazzi appeared to beat them, finding what astronomers at the time thought was a small planet that Piazzi named Ceres. The Celestial Police decided to keep looking, and two of their members, Harding and Olbers, discovered more small little planets in the same area. That uh, includes the Olbers' discovery of Vesta, which is so bright that it can sometimes be seen with the naked eye. Mm. Cool. Was it just a fluke that it was right about Uranus? Or No, no, no. Okay. No, um, and in fact, like the, the it, the planet that it predicted was kind of the asteroid belt. Oh, so, like right. this collection of objects that just didn't, for lots of complicated reasons, stick together. So T Titius nailed it, huh? He nailed it. Uh, T Titius bowed, and there were other planets too small to be predicted by th this law. And Olbers hypothesized that these minor planets were actually fragments of a planet that had been blasted apart by a comet. 
They were more likely a planet that was never able to form due to Jupiter's gravity. Eventually, Herschel would coin the word asteroid itself to describe these things, and astronomers would begin looking for them all over the place. And yeah. we are still discovering them today. And they thought of a fun little name for themselves, too. You know, I'd like to be a member of a secret society. Like, I just want a tattoo that somebody like can look at and be like, oh, you too? Yeah. Me too. You get we 20% both... off your frozen yogurt here because you got that tattoo. Yes, this is what <laughs> this is what I want. I want it to be mostly in a, le, less expensive uh, donuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next up, we're going to take a short break. Then it will be time for the fact off. All right, everybody, it's time to get ready for the fact off. Our panelists have brought science facts to present to me in an attempt to blow my mind. And after they have presented their facts, I will judge which one is going to be the best TikTok and reward it points. But to decide who goes first, I have a trivia question. On August 16th, 2020, an asteroid now known as 2020 QG flew by the Earth. The asteroid was somewhere between 10 and 20 feet in diameter, and it flew over the Pacific Ocean. But what is most striking about 2020 QG is that it flew so close to Earth that at least as of 2020, it was the closest we've ever seen an asteroid come to Earth without actually hitting it. So at its closest point, how far was this asteroid from Earth? <sighs> okay. I feel like it wasn't close enough for me to have heard about it because I didn't. If it was like 10 <laughs> feet. <laughs> it's not that big. <laughs> it flew just over your head and then yeah. decided not to go there. I'm going to guess... Uh, Oh, I I forget how far away the moon is. Isn't it like yeah. uh, like hundreds of thousands <laughs> of miles? I think away? yeah. I'm, I'm like pretending I can do math to get it. I can't. It, five thousand yeah, kilometers. I I, <laughs> you're gonna say five thousand kilometers? Yeah, that's my guess. All right. So it says five thousand kilometers. Can I say miles? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's twenty-eight miles. <laughs> <laughs> oh man <laughs> oh god um it's a bird well, it's Sam, a plane that's not in space that's in the atmosphere well maybe um, it could have been so, in the atmosphere <laughs> yeah i guess probably would probably would have slowed down and, and hit the planet eventually um it was a, around three thousand kilometers which is around two thousand miles up. ah shoot <laughs> that's really far away <laughs> it's very very close yeah. And really far away. This is very much the thing with space. It's always like, it's very, very big and also very, very small. And it's very close and very far away. And it's very empty and very full. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's space for you. Sari, you get to decide who goes first. I'll go first. So ancient Egyptian jewelry is filled with some stunning gems from the blues of turquoise and lapis lazuli to the reds of garnet and jaspers. But one scarab on a necklace from Tutankhamun's tome, tomb. Tutankhamun's tomb Tuma. stands out. It's a translucent yellowy green glass. And when researchers tested the jewel in the late 1990s, they found that it was much older than any Egyptian civilization. That means that it was collected in some way rather than forged by humans. And it turns out that geologists had been investigating these weird glassy rocks scattered throughout part of the Sahara Desert around Egypt and Libya since the 1930s. Scientists called these rocks Libyan desert glass and now believed they formed around 29 million years ago. But the way they formed is still kind of a mystery. Many think that it's an impactite, which is a category of metamorphic rock that forms because of the heat and pressure from the impact of a rock falling from space, an asteroid crashing down. So the two major hypotheses are either that an asteroid crashed into the sand and made a crater and a bunch of glassy rock chunks that have scattered over time, or that there was a huge explosion in the atmosphere, kind of like the Tunguska event or the Chelyabinsk event, that melted the rocks on the surface of the Earth below. And on the one hand, mineral analyses of these desert glass rocks, um, like the different structural elements or the chemical composition, are pointing towards the asteroid crash hypothesis. But the big thing we still haven't found is a crater in the Sahara Desert. And other places on mm. Earth that have glassy impact types like Darwin glass in Australia or Atacama desert glass in Chile 
have clear craters or meteorite chunks associated with them. And on the other hand, researchers who published a 2013 paper found a, quote, angular, black, shiny, extremely hard, and intensely fractured, end quote, rock in the Libyan desert that they called the Hypatia Stone, and they think it's part of an asteroid that exploded in the atmosphere and then fell to the ground in little weird scraps rather than smashing into the sand. So people are going to be arguing. They've been arguing for a century, and the jury is still out. Uh, an asteroid was probably involved in some way, but it might take a while for us to keep piecing together the scraps of geological evidence to figure out how this cool yellow-green desert glass formed. Is it too sandy for a crater to form? I think there would still be impacts below the sand. Like, you'd be able to tell geologically. But I'm Look not... into it, scientists. Okay. <laughs> well, I, my thought was, it got covered up by sand. Yeah. It's very... Yeah, it's sand moves around. Sand. Mm-hmm. Just like more, some sand blew over it, but like I also not a rock person, and so I'm sure that someone has thought of that. <laughs> well, I don't know if they hadn't. Our names get to be in the paper if if we're if they're right, yeah. right? Yeah. My name is Hank Green, and I have a podcast. <laughs> Listen to my theories. <laughs> have you considered that sand moves? <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, mm. so it's the whole. Sk- it's not like it's actually carved out of this glass. Mm-hmm. Oh. I got to say, it looks delicious. I want to eat that scary. <laughs> what do you think it would taste like? You know, it, yeah. Lemon candy. It, oh, come on. Mm. Nah, juicy pear. Oh. <laughs> I think, yeah, I it's think like it would taste- like a juicy pear jelly belly. The, the gummy bear, the white gummy bear, whatever flavor uh, that is. Uh, I mean, also, this is this piece of jewelry is just gorgeous. And I love the idea that they just like somebody found a piece of piece of glass and was like, I got to give this to you the You know who's going to like this? Mm-hmm. Tut. He's going to love this shit. This kid's going to love a shiny rock. Libyan desert glass. Very cool. Sam, what do you got? Hey, I have a similar story, but more sad. (laughs) Deep impact Armageddon. Don't look up. Hollywood loves to fantasize about the destruction of Earth, or at the very least, society, via an asteroid. And it's a concept that seems pretty well relegated to the world of blockbusters to us. But is it? An indigenous culture dubbed the Hopewell inhabited a lot of the middle of North America, centered in the Ohio River Valley area from around 200 BCE to around 500 CE, uh, and they have quite a legacy to this day. The Hopewell people are known for their elaborate earthwork burial mounds, irrigation systems, and religious monuments which are some of the largest like earthwork structures in the world, or maybe the largest, as well as their metalworking and extensive trade networks. Uh, and DNA analysis shows that several different indigenous nations are descended from the Hopewell people. But there is a bit of a mystery surrounding the end of Hopewell society. By the late 400s, according to archaeological findings, their culture had declined significantly, uh, and there's never really been a good explanation for why that is. But in February 2020, a group of researchers proposed to proposed an answer to this mystery straight from a disaster movie. A massive asteroid exploded in the upper atmosphere, causing repercussions that destabilized the Hopewell way of life. So their largest piece of evidence is the fact that when you dig down to the layer of dirt that was on the surface in 400 BC, you find a layer of charcoal. Uh, In fact, remnants of wooden structures from around that time at every Hopewell site that they looked at show evidence of being scorched, and organic samples Mm. from around that time also show evidence of being burned. Uh, And the evidence suggests that all of the burning in all of the places was happening at the same time. So, like, it could have been big wildfires, a big war, or even a volcano, except that the layer of charcoal soil also contains high amounts of platinum and iridium, which are both commonly found in meteors. And that jewelry and metalwork that I mentioned earlier... It contains metal forged from dang meteorites. Mm -hmm. Uh, So scientists have known that the Hopewells used meteorite metal for a long time, just like everybody was using that kind of metal back then, which is, I think, what put them on this, this line of thinking in the first place. And on top of that, there's cultural evidence of the meteor, too. So there's oral history from descendants of the Hopewell uh, that include stories about the day the sun fell out of the sky or, like, creatures coming from the sky and causing havoc. And, a very wild detail, there's even an earthwork shrine that looks like a big meteor with a tail streaking out the back of it, Uh, and researchers say that their evidence suggests that it's both located fairly near the epicenter of the asteroid's explosion, but it's also oriented the same direction that the meteor 
came from. So like the tail and head of it are pointing the right way. So based on this evidence, the meteor is thought to have exploded above the earth sometime around the 400s, demolishing crops and structures uh, in an area thought to be around 9,200 square miles, which led to food shortages and displacement, which led to the dissolution of like major population centers that the Hopewell people lived in in the Ohio River Valley. So the next time you're watching a movie where an asteroid wipes out civilization, remember that just because it hasn't happened to us doesn't mean that it hasn't happened. Whoa! I mean, this is the thing. Like the Tunguska event happened, happened yeah. in recorded history. We've got pictures of it. So obviously it's been happening for a long time. Probably every, like, you know, it's we've had big air blast meteors caught on dash cams. You know, mm -hmm. it's happened in the last 10, 20 years. So it's definitely a thing that happens. And it, so it's definitely a thing that ancient people experienced, which is a wild thought. Well, Sari had the point from the beginning. Sam brought me a story of a civilization destroyed by an asteroid, but it's maybe. It's a better fact, but it's still kind of a maybe. A lot of this stuff is maybe. How many things have we said that have been maybe on this show? Come on. Oh, everything's a maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, if anyone comes to me asking if anything's definite, absolutely not. There's a spectrum of maybe, though. And also, like, Sari's up here, like, probably there was... And I'm like, yeah. You're, Sari, Sari wouldn't even say that it was an asteroid. But it was. We just haven't found the crater. Yeah. Because the sand that moves. <laughs> I think Sam wins. Sam, you're the oh, winner of the episode. Yeah. I was going to appeal Congratulations. to a higher power if you, had, <laughs> if you had made Sari win. Congratulations to Sam. And now it's time for uh, Ask the Science Couch, where we've got some questions for our finely honed virtual couch of scientific minds. At BeForget asks... Why hasn't the belt between Jupiter and Mars coalesced into a planet? We talked a little bit about that because of Jupiter or oh. something. Yeah, well, you kind of right? talked about it. You said, for a lot of complicated reasons, and I was like waiting for you yeah. to expound, but... <laughs> <laughs> no. That's it, yeah. Well, Would it have to be real hot and melty also? It's too late. It missed the boat. Oh, they get and hot and melty when they start running into each other. Yeah, but oh, the thing okay, is, is okay. there isn't much stuff there. As Hank said, there's a lot of emptiness in space. And as much as sci-fi would like us to believe that the asteroid belt is like, ooh, I'm dodging a rock here. I'm squeezing in between boulders. They're so far mm -hmm. apart. They're like kilometers, hundreds of kilometers oh. apart. They'll That's very disappointing. Oh, yeah. Like we send we send like probes through the asteroid belt and we're all like, probably won't hit anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like we don't like check to see if they'll hit something. Oh, that's too bad. This is wild. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, in order to like find an asteroid, all these missions to asteroids need to be very carefully calculated to like find them. You're not just going to mm -hmm. run into mm -hmm. an asteroid. And a lot of them are fairly small. There are a couple big ones. So Ceres, Vesta, Pallas, and Hygieia are like the four biggest asteroids in the belt. And make up about half the mass of it. And so everything else is smaller. There's a bunch of other ones, tens of thousands to millions of uh, smaller ones. But together, the the mass is less than 4% of the moon. So even if they were to coalesce, so much of the asteroid rocky matter has been ejected from the solar system or like pulled into different places and stabilized that there isn't enough stuff to make a planet mm. anymore. Like it would be a, a loose cluster of things. But the like the physics-y explanation for it, I don't know why I put that in quotes. Uh, <laughs> the physics-y explanation <laughs> for it, I put it in quotes because I'm so unconfident in my physics abilities and I'm just waiting yes. for people to come, come get me, is that it has to do with Jupiter's gravity. Gravitational force is complicated. It's a lot of like pushing and pulling and and any two bodies have gravitational force exerting on each other. So like we are exerting gravity on the earth in the same way that the earth is exerting gravitational force on us, physics. And because of the interaction between Jupiter's gravity and Mars's gravity and the gravity of the asteroids in the asteroid belt, they, they have basically stabilized the rocks so that they don't collide with each other. So not only are they far apart because there's not very many of them and there's not much mass, but 
the the gravitational forces acting on the asteroid belt means that they are not in a collision course with each other and they're hovering in these pockets of stability or these orbits that are stable relative to the planets around it. Uh, you've ruined the asteroid belt for me. Yeah, it's just another boring well, thing now, isn't it? we could get it? it. We could make it into a planet. <laughs> we can do it. We just have to destroy Jupiter. <laughs> yeah. That's all. That's the only thing that's standing in the way of <laughs> us getting a true new rocky planet. We have to go get Jupiter. We have to tell it it can't be here anymore. It's got to go outer solar system, leave the solar system. Jupiter, we're coming for you. We're just going to light you on fire. You're made of hydrogen. You'll just explode, right? You'll just burn. You might have to destroy Mars, too, to get the extra rock from it. You could create Mars, too. move Mars out there. Yeah. Get all the asteroids to come stick to it, and then we'll bring it back in. We'll put it, like, nearby us so it's warmer. Mm -hmm. Super Mars. The new planet. If you want to ask the Science Couch your question, you can follow us on Twitter at SciShowTangents, where we will tweet out upcoming topics for upcoming episodes, or you can join the SciShowTangents Patreon and ask us on our Discord. Thank you to at Afentalia Connor on Discord and everybody else who asked us your questions for this episode. If you like this show and you want to help us out, there's some ways to do that. First, you can go to patreon.com slash SciShowTangents to become a patron, and you will support the show. You will make it possible for us to make this show. And all the people who listen to this show and love this show will be like, I am so grateful to that person for supporting it. That's that's the, that's the mostly what you get. But you also get access to things like our newsletter and our bonus episodes and us being really dumb <laughs> doing various things. <laughs> Second, you can leave us a review wherever you listen. That helps us know what you like about the show and helps other people know what you like about the show. And finally, if you want to show your love for SciShow Tangents, just... Tell, Tell people, people about, about us. us. Thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Sari Riley. And I've been Sam Schultz. SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Sam Schultz, who edits a lot of these episodes, along with Seth Glicksman. Our story editor is Alex Bello. Our social media organizer is Paula Garcia Prieto. Our editorial assistants are Debuki Chakravarty and Emma Douster. Our sound design is by Joseph Tuna Medish. Our executive producers are Caitlin Hoffmeister and me, Hank Green. And we couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. But one more thing. Before we had a specific word for asteroids, people used more general words for objects in space, like meteor, which comes from the Greek meteoros, an adjective that means high up or raised up. And that same adjective also gave us the medical term meteorism, which is where so much gas builds up in your gut that your abdomen bloats out. There are a number of different causes of meteorism, from appendix issues to bowel obstruction, but one super common symptom is as you might expect, excessive farting. So meteors are just rocks in the sky, but meteors in our body are just a bunch of farts waiting to be unleashed. <laughs> I mean, well, a meteor never landed on anyone's ass or anything that you could find. <laughs> No, I couldn't find a single <laughs> butt meteor. <laughs> no one's, no one wrote about sticking meteor, meteoric iron in their butt. So <laughs> yeah. I had to go. I mean, with I'm sure else. somebody's tried it. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, that's that's the new the new homeopathic trend is whatever <laughs> you can fit up there. Really, mm-hmm. Just make sure it has a flared end, and <laughs> cross <Yeah>. your fingers. <laughs>